Ho, ho, hello. Welcome to my Christmas vodcast. Uh, I've been partying a lot, as you can see, so let me fix this. <laughs> ah, that's better. Okay, so cue cards today. Um, happy Christmas, Merry Ho Ho, Happy Ya Ya, uh, Kwanzaa, Hanukkah, and stuff. It's holiday season. People get mad at me when I say Happy Holidays. They say you should say Merry Christmas. I'm like, well, okay. I'm still working on that one. Here we go. The Freeman Brothers are over at Jazz Bistro. That's happening tonight. Sax and bass. These guys are awesome. It's an all-star band. Uh, they pack the joint. You're going to need uh, reservations for sure. Same with Saturday. Probably sold out. Probably pretty close to sold out. Robbie Botosh and Hilario Duran together. Two pianos. They bring in a, an extra Yamaha. So there's a Yamaha and a Steinway. Hilario, Robbie, unbelievable. Uh, that's Saturday. Sunday, Robert Scott has a Charlie Brown Christmas. Robert Scott's my buddy. I've known him forever, and he's like a brother to me. He plays avant-garde, ragtime, uh, cinematic, uh, every kind of music you can imagine on the piano. But when he does Vince Guaraldi, it's just heavenly. So Charlie Brown will be screening in the background. They're not playing to the song, but it'll get the vibe in there. And it's always super popular. So Sunday night, 7 p.m., Robert Scott, I uh, believe with a trio, uh, George Kohler and Bob Scott, uh, doing Charlie Brown Christmas. Next Friday, Galen Weston, the great guitarist. He's got a killer band, and that's next Friday. You'll see there's not as many listings as usual because it's the holiday season, and people got to go home for Christmas. Lula Lounge, Yuka, and Cafe Cabano are there tonight. Yuka, really cool band. Uh, I think someone compared them to like the Amy Winehouse kind of groove, that kind of cool music. And... Uh, Cafe Cubano, well, you'll be dancing all night long at Lula Lounge if you go down there. Uh, Dang, uh, so Sondaki uh, is on Saturday. They always jam the place. That's Salsa Saturday. And then uh, on Sunday, uh, Saucy Sunday. It's, uh, that's what I just call it. It's uh, the Dang Show. It's a matinee and evening show. They sold out their night show, so they added a matinee and they are a ton of fun. It's a bit of a variety show, a bit of a freak show, and obviously very popular. They've already sold one out. Uh, next Friday, Michelle de Covedo is going to be opening up their, uh, their Havana Fridays. And if you have never seen him, whether he's playing percussion or guitar or singing, he is just a beautiful soul, and you will love his music. Moving on. Uh, oh, here we go. Hughes Room Live tonight. Kelly Lee Evans. I don't know. Okay, it's Christmas because everything is amazing. I don't know what the heck. I'd have to go see all of them if I was in town. Kelly Lee Evans is one of the greatest entertainers in Canada, and she plays Kerner Hall, and now she's playing Hughes Room Live, nice and close and intimate. Uh, I've seen her at Hughes Room Live. She'll be jumping on the amplifiers, dancing around in her bare feet. Uh, she's amazing. Amazing singer, amazing entertainer. Um, on Saturday, the world comes to Hughes Room. Parto and Sitar Fusion. It's, it's beautiful world music on Saturday. On Sunday, Anthony Gomes, uh, rockin', rock blues, amazing guitar hero. And next Friday, another guitar hero, Susie Vinnick. Mwah! So there you go. Boy, there's a lot going on there. And Homesmith Bar, Carol McCartney is there with uh, Brian Dickinson, Red Schwager, and Kieran Overs. Amazing rhythm section. Um, kind of missing John Sherwood on the list, but these guys can carry it off. John Sherwood, I only mentioned that because uh, he uh, produced a Carol McCartney record. Uh, Brian Dickinson, a master of the piano. She's in good hands. Uh, and then Saturday, Paul Novotny with Mark Eisenman and Barry Elms. Interesting. Um, all of these guys lead their own bands. All these guys make records. And I'm curious what songs Paul will be choosing for Mark Eisenman on piano and Barry Elms on bass. That's kind of cool. Uh, New Year's Eve at uh, the Old Mill Home Smith Bar, completely sold out, June Garber. So there you have it. There's a few fun things to do this week. And uh, I do want to thank my sponsors. I want to thank Barbarian Steakhouse. It is delicious in there. I went to a Christmas party. And it was just shy of scandalous. Uh, and uh, uh, Paul Barber, barberfinancial.com. You could contact Captain Paul if you have financial matters, especially coming up in the new year. 
you want some advice, maybe you're looking at your taxes, he doesn't do taxes, but he does everything else. Take a look at them and go, oh, I could be doing better with my money. Talk to Captain Paul. BarbaraFinancial.com. And finally, oh, thank you, Patreon. I'm gonna do some nice things for my Patreon people. There's uh, you know, a handful of people out there who are really helping out. This thing isn't free, so thank you for supporting it. Uh, and my producer, JJ Brown, deserves much more money than I can afford to pay him. He does such a great job. I am filled with Christmas spirit, and I am about to be even more filled with Christmas spirit because Lauren Ferrero is going to be my guest. If we make any references to uh, uh, her concert at Jazz Bistro, Oops, it's over. Uh, but I spoke with her about a week and a half ago, and she is a lovely woman who came out with a brand new record, and we're going to talk all about it, okay? So here we go. Lauren Ferrero. Oh, wait, this one. That's it. Lauren Ferrero. Hello, Hi. hello. Hello. Hey, you're cute. Oh, well, thanks. Every you're, redhead is. You're, you're, I, I agree with that, actually. Hello, Ginger. Um, tell me about uh, your perkiness. Were you born perky? Uh, I'm the baby, so maybe I got all the attention, so that made me bubbly and perky. I don't know. Yep. <laughs> My now, parents might say that. We're going to talk about your singing in a minute, but I want to start off with as your professional speaker, public speaking coach. Yeah, that's my world. Right. So, I, I don't even know where to start. How, let's start at the University of London. You're in England. No, you're not at Western in London, Ontario. You're in England. No, so I went to the Royal Conserv uh, the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama. It's a mouthful, and they have the biggest voice speech program in the world, where people go to learn how to voice. So it's not singing. It was to figure out how do I get someone on stage and have them communicate. So right. I brought that back to Canada, and I went very corporate business, marketing, branding, how to get people's keynotes on stage. Well, it's a very important job because there could be someone who's a genius, Fortune 500 company head honcho, but then he gets in front of people and he's the most boring person in the world. Yeah, and we we love that. We love to put on the blazer, even though I'm wearing a blazer, mm -hmm. um, and be you know professional and all this kind of stuff, and it's like, I'm bored listening to you. This isn't working. So that was my... Um, idea was to sort of change the culture of public speaking. Now, did you learn how to say aluminium and schedule when and you were in England? Vitamins. <laughs> yeah, vitamins, yeah. You got all I that. I didn't take. Okay. But I was shocked when I first heard uh, alum I can't aluminium. Say. Aluminium. Yeah. yeah I, know. <laughs> I was like, I'm not sure what's being said right now. Um, <laughs> where are you though. from originally? I am from a very, very small, small town called Sutton, technically Willow Beach, Ontario, which is about an hour and 20 minutes north of Toronto. Wow. I know where Sutton is, and yeah. Willow Beach? Willow Beach is like a street long. <laughs> like, there's maybe two streets in Willow Beach. Did you also study at George Brown? I taught at George Brown, taught at Ryerson. Oh, professor voicing, of speech, yeah, yes. Voicing and speeching. And speaking. Ryerson as well, right? <laughs> yes. And yes. Waterloo? Wa so Waterloo is business communications, and Ryerson and George Brown was the arts department. So all everybody, no matter what your platform is, needs to know how to voice and speak effectively. So it, it was across the board, arts and, and business. That's where I trained people. But I myself went to Ryerson Theatre School. Right. Yes. Now, classical theatre. Yeah. That Was that your first step? The, the first thing you did, you're out of high school and you're going into classical theater? Actually, I started early, early on in theater. So I was always performing in a choir, doing all of that. And Annie, then, maybe? I, I, Sorry, redhead. No, no I, I didn't actually mean to. was. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm actually not kidding. <laughs> and 19, way too old. <laughs> right, right, right. Like, they actually hired all the orphans to just be a little taller to, <laughs> to, to match my age. But um, no, so I would I would perform then, and then when I started my business, I was training everyone else, and then that's when that all of a sudden, hey, I used to do this. So obviously, you can help people if somebody has a Broadway role or a film or even a TV commercial. You could probably offer some good advice there. Uh, train them, and I used to. I used to train people for auditions, West End, uh, Hollywood films, commercials, voiceovers. What is a key thing without giving every trade secret away? And yeah. one little interview here. What is a key thing you would tell somebody about the auditioning process that they may not know? Go with your gut. Everyone's trying to sound different, or just go with your first instinct once you read the script. I'm going to do it this way and go. 
I, it sounds very cliche, like commit to your, you know, decision or whatever. But if you spend too much time trying to make this fancy, uh, you're sounding like you're trying. Everybody's trying just a little too hard. What about people who kind of live the part before they go into the audition or dress the part or go over the top? Is that a bonus or is that superfluous? Well, it... it it depends because some people really need to get into it that way. That's their method of, of getting into it. And sometimes you maybe you're auditioning in front of people who just can't picture you as the doctor or the teacher. So you kind of dress up to be like, see, I really can play this. Yeah. So it all it all depends. But essentially, if you're just being honest when you're speaking, then that will sell me. What about casual versus mysterious? Uh, if somebody comes into a role, I have the problem of I come in and I'm so casual. I act like I really don't need this role and I'm just going to say hi to everybody and be very There's your casual. fine line. <laughs> right. You got, I go too it. far the like, casual way. Commit a little, James. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> <Right>. yeah. <laughs> Please dress up a little. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. there. Thanks, Coach. <laughs> You're welcome. That was uh, free. Um, uh, Huffington, Huff Post contributor and TEDx speaker trainer. Yeah. Those are other things you do. Yes. So I write a lot of articles for on, on all of this. How do we voice? How do we speak? What, what are we messing up on? And TEDx, well, geez, everybody wants to do a TEDx. So they all call and say, hi, I want to do a TEDx. And I say, all right, have you been accepted for a, for right. a, a TEDx? And do you actually have a story. So yeah. Just because you're alive doesn't mean you are you have a TED story in you. So what is it you want to say? And I help bring that to life. Right. So Ted, TEDs are a very different world than sort of regular keynotes. Right. Because you really have to have a point. People have to say this was time well spent, not, oh, yeah. we're talking, the CEO is talking to me about something I need to know about. You got to have an idea. That's the whole thing. You got to change something. What's the difference between a Fortune 500, a uh, uh, big shot, and Joe Schmo, who who just has a speech he has to give? Do you approach oh, them differently? Oh, such a good question. It's such a good question. So, employees are worried about what the CEO thinks if they present. Like they're going to wonder how I got my job. If I can't describe this, if I can't explain this high level, and the CEO is very concerned with what the employee thinks. How They're going to wonder how I got my job. How am I the CEO? At the end of the day, we're all human. Mm -hmm. And we're all worried about what other people think. We're all worried about what they're going to wonder how I got my job and I'm terrible at this. So when it comes to presenting... That's funny. That's an actor's even. thing, isn't it? Well, yeah. A lot all, of actors say, I'm a con. I don't. I just pretend I'm someone else. Why do I have all this money? It's it's We're even keel when it comes to training for speaking in public. We're all wanting the same thing. Yeah. There's just different avenues to train you to get it out. You uh, mentioned some things. So uh, voice is obvious that some people need to find their speaking voice in a way, right? Mm -hmm. Some people don't like their, their voice. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yes. Um, if someone comes to me wanting voice training because they don't like their voice, I... A, I ask, why, like, why? Like, what is it? Because someone might have said something to them and now they want to change their voice. So it's not automatic, well, yes, I can change your voice, I can modify it. It's, why? <laughs> why do you want this? And also, it's nothing something I would solicit. Because why do you... It, I've had women come to me and say, I need more respect in the office. I need to change my voice. Mm -hmm. That's a massive, well, you need to question the culture in your workplace. <laughs> it's like, right. why aren't you getting respect? Why yeah. is no one taking you serious? You know, all those things. So, mm -hmm. yeah, you can modify your voice in many ways. And um, you need to, as an actor, to take on different roles, too. Right. What about body language? Body, I always say your body language is influenced by your intention. Your voice and your body is influenced by your intention. So if you're angry, your body's going to respond to that. Now... If people are stuck on stage, you know, like this, or they're picking mm -hmm. at their fingers and their hair, that's, I'm going to work on your nerves, mm -hmm. things like that, your intention. I don't necessarily work on, you stand like this, do this. Right. I find that very trite. Right. And also, then it won't work for everybody because some well, people will be really awkward. Yeah, yeah. I mean, your body responds to what you say. So if you're not listening to what you're saying, your body is going to be stuck. So I'd rather work on, you don't know what you're talking about, before I work on, put your hands here. One thing I read from you is... Is that you often tell people if they're nervous that a script can be your enemy a script can be your enemy because you want to stick to it you have to trust that you have the instincts to come off the page for a second you you can't be glued to that thing you also will sound robotic if you're stuck to it so get a sense of what you want to say and then be able to come off the page at the right. end of the sentence same problem I guess with PowerPoint some people rely uh, only on visuals <laughs> and they don't deliver no, a message no they're to support 
what you're talking about and people will just turn around and they stare and they go oh the next thing i want to talk about and i have 67 slides for a five minute presentation like right it's not working it's not it <laughs> so no. it's a cheater it's and people might yeah. feel like look at all the effort i did on this thing well also but they're not communicating yeah it's usually excel sheets and bar charts and all those kinds of things it's there to support your message it's not there to uh, i have a presentation powerpoint no no do you need slides i'd rather just listen to you talk right but Visuals also support the audience sometimes or help the audience, so it all depends. But usually, yes, we're it's too much. Yeah, yeah, too much. it's a cheater. Uh, and what about mindset? Like, so you 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 walk into something. Is there a bit of training or something you can do to calm yourself down or to get in the zone? Their mindset is probably the first thing I address when I talk to someone because they they will say, "Well, Lauren, don't I have to see you?" Because I do a lot of work on online, so anybody around the mm -hmm. world we can work together. And they said, "Well, don't you need to see my body language? Don't you need to see my?" I'm like, "We don't even have content. We don't even have. You're aiming for for to be Oprah in a minute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we don't. You're not even on your feet right. at all right now. We have to get what the heck you want to talk about. Your content or mm -hmm. script, text, whatever you want to call it. Right. There's so many things before wanting to be perfect on 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 stage, and that's also." one of the problems is we're just aiming for the red carpet and there's so the mindset of i have to be it has to be and someone's watching look you got to get rid of that right so yes mindset get up and tell everything. your story do your thing. everything yeah i like that um uh, you, you mentioned contents uh presence yeah presence is uh, we love a podium we love to be stuck behind that thing we white knuckle it uh, it's security i get it uh, academics, I always say, love it. Every academic thing I do, I'm like, where's the podium? There it is. <laughs> so, yep. But it's everyone. It's not and even academics. like a, even a lapsed Catholic can relate yeah. to it because there's always a, a sermon from a podium somewhere. <laughs> True. <laughs> um, I have a lot of uh, priests and ministers, actually, yeah. pastors. Um, so they, there's, you lack the presence to be to be comfortable on stage and that's the goal is to be comfortable for for all of this but when you hide behind a podium i don't get to see you you lack vulnerability you can lack vulnerability <clears throat> so presence is is just you being like hi i have something to share with you as opposed to the 2020 report on now you're just mm -hmm. at me right presence is hey how's it going right and that's so you can walk sense. away from the podium and then go back to it exactly just show go, people go, that there's a stage your, yeah, yeah. And check your notes if you need to i always go hang on a second i'm not sure what i wanted to say here i go check my notes there it is okay right. seventh thing i wanted to say and no one thinks anything of it we're so scared with can i walk and check my notes of course are you a human <laughs> <laughs> right. can i gesture lauren well of course are you human mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> can i raise my voice here well yeah are you angry yeah, like <laughs> that's right so, so just do it you just do it yeah. we're so we want you to just chat with us yeah. absolutely i love that when did you figure out i guess this would be in theater times when did you figure out you could sing no much earlier so mm -hmm. Quick story. I was about ten, and musical theater was always in our in my house. Jazz, mm -hmm. musicals, plays. Uh, my dad loved opera, so I guess we're, we were artsy. Mm -hmm. um, and we were playing in the house. Had to succeed in business without really trying. The That's musical. a fun musical. Yeah, yeah. And I started to sing like the opera part at the end. I remember this. It's so crazy. My parents went, "Huh?" <laughs> like. Who, who is What's that? she doing? What is she doing? And then my mom called the local theater and was like, you know, like every mom, I think my daughter can sing. And and I kind of could. I could just hold a note. I always had a mature voice. Even when I was younger, it was where did her lungs come from? We thought it was lungs for some reason. Yeah, right. um, where So I sang and I also just liked to speak in front of an audience. But I didn't know it was like public speaking. I would just sort of, I'll do the announcements today or... I'll walk up for Remembrance Day and do the poem. I just never thought it was a skill or a talent or she's confidence. It just Came kind natural, of was like, yeah. I'll just do this. Oh, is this something? I didn't know. Right. Um, I didn't know I had an ear. For well, music then, or what took you so long? You finally made your Christmas no. album, which is so <laughs> sweet. And I must say, uh, it, it feels just effortless. You're just singing good classic songs. Yeah on key with character it's just a perfect simple classic christmas record you know i think we get um myself like many it's it's you you finish school and you open a business and when you're an entrepreneur it's it's your everything you're mopping the floors you're doing the accounting and you're training someone and you're plus i taught like it was all facilitation and coaching for others which is great but I'm sure we can all relate to oh you forget what you do so it got to the point where i was training people in 
well, where's that audition? Because <laughs> oh, I can do that. Right. Or, or just, I... I right, I, did that ever happen? You trained someone for a play and you went, wait, I like, want that part. I totally want that. <laughs> so, but I'm on this side of the desk now. Yeah. And, and it wasn't until I had to do a mic test for someone and I just started singing something and they were like, oh, you sing. And then my partner went, do you sing? My partner didn't even know I sang. Ryerson Theatre School didn't even know I sang because it was classical music or classical Well, I acting. heard you doing a mic test uh, on a big stage with nobody in the room. Yeah. I heard uh, that recording yeah. and it sounded like a real singer. There was, I'm like, you were pitchy. The voice had character. I'm like, you're telling me this person isn't recording or, or singing yeah. live? Yeah. And, and then you it were. was, you need to do something. And I was like, I love Christmas songs. <laughs> so, yeah. and I love... Uh, very traditional, warm and fuzzy Christmas carols. Like around Christmas, I love Perry uh, Como. I love um, Karen Carpenter. Um, Bing Crosby, uh, not, Dean Martin. Not Sandra D. I'm losing her name. Mm -hmm. um, Doris Day. You yeah, know, like things right. like that. Yep. Yeah, I love those kinds of sounds. So, and that's what I'm drawn to. And so that's what I did. Well, you seem to have a natural uh, friendship with Attila Fiesch, who did your arrangements. <gasps> what was it like preparing to make a record, your first record? Oh, he's so <laughs> he's so uh, easy in a sense, like, let's try this and let's try this. We actually had to pare things down because we were getting to the point where it was like, and then elephants can enter the stage <laughs> and we'll have this going on. And we were like, wait a second. <laughs> Yeah. We also don't have ten million dollars to get out <laughs> elephants and all that stuff, but we we definitely can bounce back and forth on how about we do this? Let's try this, or or let's not do anything and leave this one just beautifully as it is. Like you have to have the ability to do nothing, right? As well, just the song doesn't need anything doesn't more. Need, yeah. It doesn't need a vocal gymnastics. It doesn't just. So what is your perfect Christmas? What's a tradition that you do all the time that obviously now you made a soundtrack for your own Christmas Eve dinner yeah, party? That's crazy. Uh, <laughs> that's, yeah, it's bizarre. Well, first thing that's come to mind, I'm Italian, uh, and I don't know why this has come to mind, but uh, fish on New Year's Eve, Christmas Eve is what we would always have. So cause you're not supposed to have um, red meat. So Fish and tomatoes and pasta and all that was always very Christmassy to me. And of course, I think of my parents and opening, you know, presents, things like that. That's just spending time with them. Food. Do eating. you still get home for Christmas? I do. Wow. I do. Oh yeah. Heck yeah. My parents are are alive and they're well and they still want to cook. And, and <laughs> There's no it, takeover. And is it still yet. Willow Lane? Willow Beach. Willow Beach. Uh, <laughs> technically, they've moved down the street to Sutton. So it's at least like those little small town areas where it's like, oh, we're in a new town now, and you. Blinked. But it's really only a block away. Yes. So <laughs> yeah, they're on. they're still in Sutton. Well, congratulations. The record is great. I assume you'll be making another record of another kind of music or something else down the road. Uh, I think standards are next. Mm -hmm. Doing some lovely, gorgeous covers. That's yeah. the that's the idea. Yeah, just to just to do something besides Christmas, but I'd love to do Christmas every year. Yeah, well, That's congratulations! It's a great Thank record. You. Cheers! Thank you very much. Thank Bye. you. What a nice lady. That's hey lady. That's uh, Lauren Ferrero, and uh, you should pick up her Christmas record. It's around digitally, and you know how you find that stuff. Uh, next week, Ori Dagan is coming in to talk about the year that was the year of jazz in Toronto. This guy goes out as much as I do. I see him all the time. That's how I know. Uh, he's an amazing guy and a great singer, but he's also out on the scene doing a million things. So we're going to go kind of talk about both his singing and his, uh, uh, his natural ability to be a bon vivant and raconteur. I don't know. We'll find out tomorrow. I mean, next week. Oh, I'm hungover. Bye.